Acid-Based Disorders, presented by Dr. Kevin Pei. Please welcome back Dr. Pei. Hello again. Uh, so let's uh, we'll finish up with acid-based disorders. Um, uh, I don't have any financial disclosures. Uh, so you know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the principles of acid base, and most more importantly, just for you to have a you know simple, recognized way of uh, uh, managing or diagnosing the causes between all the metabolic and respiratory disturbances. Um, principles of uh, principles of acid base. So our bodies are designed to be held in a very tight pH range, right? And the reason, the, the way that we're able to hold ourselves into a very tight pH range, because it's so important for all sorts of homeostatic processes, enzymes, uh, all physiologic processes, is by buffer system, and and that's why. Uh, we can undergo large amounts of stress with very little changes in our pH. And Henderson Hasselbach's equation um, is basically at two points. One, we can measure pH or the pH that we uh, we get in our little dipsticks as but as a log value of what happens when you split a uh, weak acid, right? When you split a weak acid, the ratio of its conjugated base over the acid itself, the weak acid particularly, gives you the idea of what their pH is. But the mo more important uh, realization from Hender Henderson Hasselbach's equation is that um, the importance of buffer systems. This pH, because of this equation, it governs the idea that the pH doesn't change very much when you have a conjugated base that's separated from its weak acid because of the buffer systems. All right. Let's start with the question. Human physiologic pH is tightly regulated with buffer systems capable of attenuating large changes in the acid base. These buffer systems include all of the following except uh, plasma proteins, lactic acid, hemoglobin, carbonic acid, and bicarb, uh, and the last choice being phosphate. Great, lactic acid is not a uh, is not a a, a buffer, but uh, the other ones are very important buffers: plasma proteins, hemoglobin, carbonic acid, and bicarbon phosphate. We'll look at uh, a few of these buffer systems individually. Our body's defense to acid-base derangement is again on these blood, um, the blood buffers. Um, the compensatory mechanisms are also there, right? So the buffers are super important, but also we have compensatory mechanisms um, for metabolic and respiratory derangements. Now, if you have a metabolic derangement, you have respiratory compensation. If you have a respiratory derangement, you have metabolic compensation. Here are some general rules, right? If you have a metabolic disturbance, that can be quickly compensated with respiratory. Here's the problem for us to rest, for us to have a respiratory compensation for a metabolic process. It involves either hyperventilating or hypoventilating. Either of those things are sustainable over a long period of time, okay? Now, if you have a respiratory problem and you, uh, we compensate by metabolic process, well, what's the downside of the metabolic process? Well, it takes time, doesn't it? Because our kidneys need a little bit of time to adjust. Okay? So there are, these are systems are in place so that we don't have huge swings in our pH as best as we can. And this is the concept that is so important for this pH. The asymptotic uh, uh, graph of life is back, and this time the x-axis is the volume of strong base that's added, and the y-axis is pH, right? So if I kept on adding and adding and adding volumes of strong base to a weak acid, the pH doesn't change very much over a very broad volume of um, strong base um, outlined by that green box. All right. So when you have, but when you add stresses to that, or when you have disturbances in your buffer systems, when you overwhelmed your respiratory or uh, uh, metabolic compensatory mechanisms. Uh, then what happens is this graph is no longer asymptotic. You have the, the minute you add a strong base or you add a strong acid, it affects your pH and affects it in, uh, uh, to a great degree. So our buffer systems are carbonic acid. We're uh, familiar with the carbonic acid system in our kidneys. And um, phosphate, believe it or not, is also a, um, is a buffer system and as well as plasma proteins. <clears throat> 
All right, so here's the carbonic acid and um, bicarb buffer system, right? So on the, on the uh, let's start off on the right side of your screen, right? So you have an acid, the H and the bicarb, right? If those two will combine, those will two combine to form the moiety that's in the center there, and ultimately that breaks up to H2O, which is completely innocuous, and carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe off, right? So look back at the right, right side of the screen again. It doesn't really matter what you do. You can add a little bit of H. You can add a little bit of bicarb. As long as this buffer system exists, all you're going to do is you're going to breathe it off, and you're going to pee it out by this carbonic in, um, uh, system. Okay. What about the phosphate buffer? Why is that important? So again, let's take a look at both sides of this, right? So you have acid on the left of the screen, and you have phosphate, sodium phosphate, on the right side of the screen. Of course, all the numerals and everything is just to maintain electrical neutrality, right? Okay. So if you're, let's say you, onto, let's look at the left side of the screen. Let's say you just added, added hydrochloric acid, right? That's going to break down in your body to hydrogen and chloride. That hydrogen is going to combine with the phosphate that's broken down, remove one sodium, and now it's going to have a monosodium phosphate, right? That monosodium phosphate is going to combine with the hydrogen, right? And you essentially get now um, normal saline, NaCl, and an innocuous sodium phosphate, right? And that's excreted through your kidney. So you see how, so on the left side, let's pour a little hydrochlorothiazide into the mix you have um, phosphate buffers that prevents huge uh, swings. That H, that hydrogen moiety, is not going to uh, all of a sudden go down and uh, represent itself as a decrease in your pH. Uh, or, so phosphate, the ph phosphate buffer system is also very important for bases. So look on the left side of your, uh, right side of your screen, right? And you say to yourself, let's add, a little bit, let, let's add a little bit of base in the form of sodium hydroxide, right? So the sodium breaks off, the OH breaks off, What's going to happen? Well, this time the sodium uh, uh, phosphate is going to give up one of its hydrogens, right? It's going to say, I can buffer this because I'm going to combine my hydrogen with a hydroxide, which makes water. And you're just going to pee it out, right? So again, pour some, uh, pour some uh, uh, alkaline material in or a base in. It's not going to affect your pH very much if you have a, an intact phosphate buffer system. All right, let's do a question. Due to hypoperfusion, the patient develops profound metabolic acidosis. What happens to the body's ability to unload oxygen to the tissues? Um, no change, worse, improved. Oh, an even split. All right. So, um, did you hyperperfusion the patient develops profound metabolic? What happens to the body's ability to unload oxygen to the decrease? Yeah, so, so the metabolic acidosis causes what kind of a shift? It causes a, it causes a rice shift. I apologize. Yeah, so the uh, metabolic acidosis causes a right shift of the, uh, of the oxygen dissociation curve, and, and it's designed to be that way, isn't it? Because if you have a hyperperfuse state and you have metabolic acidosis, what it's suggest suggesting to you is that now what we want to do is have the oxygen unload easier by shifting the graft over to the right side. Yeah, so the answer is, uh, the answer is improved. The oxygen molecules dissociate from the hemoglobin with greater ease in a hypoperfuse state. All right, so... Uh, uh, B will be metabolic alkalosis, right? So I apologize. So it'll be C uh, for improved oxygen molecules are dissociating hemoglobin with greater ease in a hypoperfuse state. That was a What's that? that was a yeah. Uh, to see if you're paying attention, and you are clearly good. So just a reminder: the oxygen uh, hemoglobin dissociation curve again, right? So the right shifting and the left shifting. I think it's neat that our bodies were designed to shift to the right in a metabolic acidemic picture where one is hypoperfuse, because we're designed to, to unload um, uh, the oxygen in that state when we need it the most. Okay, carboxyhemoglobin again. This is a shifting of the curve to the left, right? We talked about that um, during the lecture for uh, fluids and electrolytes. <clears throat> 
Um, and uh, the affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen, right? So the other thing to remember is the half-life of uh, carboxyhemoglobin on 100% oxygen is about an hour, just a little over an hour. If you put up somebody in, uh, into two atmospheric hyperbaric, it's about 23 minutes. Okay, so one of the uses for hyperbarics is somebody with carboxyhemoglobin, um, carboxyhemoglobin um, uh, poisoning, okay? All right, so let's do a stepwise approach to the acid base analysis. All right, so just to keep it very simple, and I, you know, I know most of you are probably already very comfortable with uh, reading ABGs and evaluating ABGs, but let's just make, make it very systematic. So, first, you want to determine the primary disturbance, then, you want to evaluate for the compensa compens whether or not there was appropriate compensation. Okay, you're going to evaluate the gap, and lastly, you're going to evaluate the gap if you've decided the primary process is a metabolic acidosis. All right, so let's do an example, right? Look at this ABG. You have a pH of 7.31, a uh, CO2 of 38, and a bicarb of 18, okay? So in this situation, when you analyze ABGs, you want to hold the ABG to perfection. So you want to say that the bicarb has to be 24 and the CO2 has to be 40, all right? Because clearly we recognize 38 is not that bad, 18 is not that bad, right? But that's, you can't systematically analyze your ABG that way. So you look at a pH of 7.31, and this patient is in, uh, uh, has an acidemia, right? So then you go to the CO2 and you say, that's 38. That 38 is a little lower than the usual 40. So that's not the primary cause of that acidosis or acidemia, right? So then you go to the bicarb. Well, the bicarb is low. So the bicarb is 18 and you are normally expect 24, right? So now you have a primary diagnosis of a metabolic acidosis. When you have a metabolic acidosis, we compensate by respiratory mechanisms, right? We compensate by respiratory mechanisms. And those mechanisms are governed by uh, several equations, right? Winter's formula. But it's governed by an equation that says, well, your CO2 should also decrease by a certain amount to try to compensate. Now, one rule of uh, ABG and really one rule of our homeostatic processes for buffers is our buffer systems, no matter how good it is, is incapable of correcting yourself or compensating yourself back to complete normal pH of 7.4. All right? So I'm going to repeat that. You cannot compensate yourself back to 7.4. Right? Now, we as clinicians can do it for the patient, whether it's on the ventilator or give bicarb or whatever, whatever it is they're doing. We can manipulate it so it can go back to, to 7.4. And why do I say that? It's important because when you have patients who clearly have respiratory or metabolic disturbances and you see that they have a pH of 7.4, they likely have some sort of a combined process. All right? Okay. So for this patient, for this patient, um, uh, you know that they're not fully compensated because they're at 7.31. So that bicarb should probably be, sorry, that the uh, CO2 should probably be to the order of about 35 if you uh, go and calculate Winter's formula, all right? Okay, so metabolic acidosis. So um, in, uh, the, when you have a patient with a metabolic acidosis, you want to see whether or not there's an anion gap, right? The major determinants of whether or not you have a reason why you have a metabolic acidosis, okay? Um, the... Even though when you calculate anion gap, you are looking at the major cation and the major um, anions of sodium chloride and bicarb, clearly there are other unmeasured anions that are in play, right? Um, normal anion gap is 8 to 16 milliequivalents per liter, okay? Anion gap is a poor surrogate of lactic acidosis, and it's important to remember that only less than 80% sensitive as a reflection of increased lactic acid, all right? So, um, uh, and then the probably, this is probably um, due to the wide range of what we consider as normal for anion gaps. Right? Anion gaps should be adjusted for albumin, but once again, because albumin is not listed here as an un unmeasured anion, right? And am, um, albumin is um, considered a weak acid, right? And it actually can account for up to 75% of your an anion gap. So there's a correcting, correction factor for albumin as it pertains to your anion gap. All right. So on the left side are your major anions, on the right side are your cations, and none of these that we, the only ones that we measure, unfortunately, is sodium, potassium, sorry, sodium, bicarbon, chloride, right? But clearly there are other things in play here that we don't measure. And that's why you sometimes look at this and you go, well, there's no, there's a metabolic acidosis and there's um, an anion gap, but these numbers look normal, so I'm not sure where it's coming from. Anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis, this one I do remember from medical school, mud piles, right? These are the um, potential thing, most common things that causes an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Lactic acidosis is among that, even though I just told you that it's only 80% sensitive as a reflection of a metabolic acidosis, okay? 
I would say that the patient population that we most commonly see probably with an anion gap is a DKA patient, right? Diabetic keto um, acidosis. Okay. So what happens when you have a normal anion gap acidosis, right? What happens when you have a normal anion gap acidosis? These are the renal tubular acidosis patients. These are the diarrhea patients, right? So how come they have normal anion gaps? That's because for the major anions and cations that we measure, they have equal loss and gain, right? So your loss of bicarb, you have a gain of a chloride. Now you have electrical neutrality, but um, it, it doesn't demonstrate itself as an increase in the anion gap. Um, this is a busy slide, so you can just look at it upon your own time. But basically, on the left, the one that I circle for particularly small intestines, um, why it's important as a regulation for a normal anion gap when you lose um, when you lose a significant volume in a diarrhea, um, diarrhea patient, because you're going to lose bicarb, hold down to chloride, and uh, you don't have any difference in terms of the um, in terms of the anion gap. Right? So acid-base disturbances and balanced disturbances, right? So here's the interaction among the carbonic and hydrase bicarb um, buffer system. We talked about that a little bit earlier, how if you were to add a little bit of bicarb, it would combine with um, uh, hydrogen and it would um, eventually be, um, be hyperventilated out as CO2, right? So here's your bicarb reserve all the way to the right side of the screen, right? Um, and uh, all the way to the left of the screen. This is just the same sort of pictorial representation of what we discussed uh, uh, in terms of the bicarb. Um, so this is Winter's formula for metabolic acidosis, what your expected CO2 should be, right? So 1.5 times your bicarb plus 8 plus or minus 2. And the nice thing about respiratory compensation, I re, um, I'll reiterate, is just that it's fast. Unfortunately, what happens is that what you're asking the patient to do for a metabolic acidosis is to hyperventilate. Hyperventilate as strictly defined by your CO2 level, right? So you're asking the patient to hyperventilate, which, of course, is not overall a, uh, a good thing. Um, so you, role of using bicarb for metabolic acidosis. So, you know, can we just throw a little bit of bicarb into a patient? Well, first of all, um, as, as reminded by that question, um, the acidosis is not a bad thing, right, necessarily. Acidosis is physiologic. It's to say I'm hypoperfused, and one of the nice things about acidosis is it encourages oxygen dissociation, right? So we shouldn't always jump on trying to correct a 7.3 pH. Maybe that's actually helping us unload oxygen, right? Bicarb is not an effective buffer in physiologic pH, right? It's more of a CO2 transport. All it's doing is it's allowing, it's converting the bicarb over so you can breathe it out, okay? So in normal pH levels, bicarb is actually not a great buffer system. It has uh, limited utility. A bicarb bolus can actually increase your PACO2 uh, burden by that very mechanism that we looked at, right? Right here, right? So you can actually increase your CO2 burden. It's not helping your situation in terms of the metabolic acidosis picture. And it can uh, potentially augment lactic um, production. So recall, we don't give bicarb liberally anymore in CPR. Most recent versions of ACLS has largely removed bicarb um, bolusing of patients, right? So when do we use bicarb? Um, when do we use bicarb for patients? Well, really the populations of patients that we use bicarb are twofold in my mind. One is a very profound acidemia, like somebody like a pH of 7.15, and they're, uh, I mean, they're going to code, right? Because their cardiac, um, their uh, myocardium is very irritated. Their enzymes are not, all of their uh, uh, enzymes are not going to function properly at that pH. So that's potentially somebody you want to give a little bit of bicarb to. But the most important patient population to give bicarb to are the renal failure failure patients. Why? Because the renal failure patients cannot absorb bicarb. They, they have bicarb loss, right? They, have no, they don't have the mechanism in place as well as we do to resorb our bicarb. So in those patients, in renal failure patients, we can get bicarb. All right. Let's talk about metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Metabolic alkalosis, most of the bicarb is res resorbed in the proximal tubule. Okay. So the proximal tubule is very important for bicarb um, absorption. That's also, by the way, the, uh, the point of uh, significant loss of bicarb in renal failure patients, right? Hydrogen secretion happens in the distal uh, tubules, to, again, to maintain electrical neutrality. So to maintain electrical neutrality, chloride and bicarb move in opposite directions, right? So when you're trying to figure out things that, what happens with the, when the bicarb goes down, the chloride comes up, it's just to remain electrical neutrality. Um, otherwise, you'd have too much uh, you'd, you'd be losing too many anions, and there's no um, anion balance. 
Okay. Gastric losses, right? This is the classic NG tube suctioning patient or the one who's been vomiting a lot. Stomach juices are uh, by nature high in hydrochloric acid, right? HCl. Okay. So as you're vomiting, you're suctioning out the NG tube, you have a significant chloride deple depletion, which then um, stimulates bicarb. Remember that rule, the bicarb and chloride go in opposite directions, right? So the body, if the body is losing a significant amount of chloride, the bicarb is going to be absorbed, right? And on top of that, the hypovolemia does what? So you lost a lot of volume from your GI um, system, and the, the, the hypovolemia, remember, um, stimulates the ADH. Remember one of those three things that stimulates ADH production, right? So now all of a sudden it's going to say, oh, I need to hold on to more sodium. And while I'm holding on to more sodium, I'm going to get rid of more potassium. Remember that sodium-potassium pump? Right? And I said to you, well, I'm holding on to three sodiums, but I'm only letting go two potassiums. There's no electrical neutrality there, so now what? Well, the body says, well, let me spit out some hydrogen just to make it even. All right? So the net effect of all of this is what? Hypochloremic, metabol hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. All right? That's what ends up happening. What's that? With, uh, that's right, with paradoxical aciduria. That's right, just, the, just for a great comment, right? Isn't that a classic general surgery thing with the NG2 volume loss? So remember, it's not just about the chloride loss, it's also about volume loss. And volume loss, above anything else, stimulates, stimulates ADH. It's a very, very strong, potent uh, mechanism. All right? Okay, here's a question. Infusion of um, furosemide leads to A hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, hypermag, hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis, or increased sodium resorption in the proximal tubules. <clears throat> Everybody got this. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Um, loop diuretics in general work in the loop of Henle, so it's not acting on the proximal tubule, right? Uh, additionally, um, uh, loop diuretics, were, it's a poison to the sodium chloride pumps, right? So, so um, uh, it, you're going to be leaching sodium out. You're going to be leaching potassium out. All of this stuff is about electrical neutrality, right? And in the process, while you're getting rid of all this stuff, you're holding on to um, uh, bicarb. And this is the scenario, by the way, that loop diuretic loop diuretic induced uh, metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia, that metabolic alkalosis will never go away until you do what? Replete the potassium, all right? So loop diuretic induced metabolic al um, hypokalemia cannot be, f uh, uh, cannot be f uh, metabolic alkalosis cannot be fixed until you fix the hypokalemia, all right? So take a look at this. There's the poison with the little red uh, circle, right? Lasix, or furosemide, is a sodium chloride potassium channel blocker, right? That pump stops working, so then what happens? We lose sodium, we lose potassium, right? It all goes, but it's trying to maintain electrical neutrality. So there's our hypokalemia right away, right? And then later on down the road, what happens is that um, the um, bicarb is reabsorbed, right? Because you, you're having a lot of sodium go out, right? And to maintain re electrical neutrality, it's trying to bring the bicarb back, in, uh, 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 back into the lumen. Um, 35 year old man was mountain bike, uh, mountain climbing and was lost. Uh, and when rescued, the patient was taken to the emergency department and ABG demonstrated a metabolic alkalosis, so a pH of 7.51. The urine chloride was less than 25 milliequivalents per liter. The next step in management is give Lasix, uh, give sodium, or give saline, give hydrochloric acid as a buffer. Uh, or expected management. Urine chloride is not useful in the setting of acute alkalemia. Fantastic, right? So even if you don't really remember, if frankly, for this kind of a question in terms of a test-taking thing, even if you don't remember what the significance of chloride responsive or chloride non-responsive metabolic alkalosis is, basically this patient is, has a metabolic alkalosis. You can guess that it's because of a contraction alkalosis because they've been lost and they're dehydrated, right? So if you're lost and you're dehydrated, you didn't even know what you didn't even need to know what urine chloride did. You can go, oh, I should give them a bolus of saline, all right? <clears throat> 
Okay. Chloride responsive. So it's trying to hold on to it's trying to hold on to chloride. It's trying to hold on to chloride because of that bicarb loss situation earlier. Uh, sorry, because of that uh, volume loss, it's very similar to to this situation right here. It's almost like a loop diuretic, kept on diuresing, diuresing, right? So chloride responsive, as evidenced by chloride less than urine chloride less than 25 milliequivalents per liter, is suggesting to you. Um, that the patient is hypovolemic, and all, that's easy. It's just contraction alkalosis, okay? So that's called the chloride-responsive metabolic alkalosis. But again, you know, you didn't even need to know that really to answer that question. Okay, so chloride responsiveness, right? Dip the urine chloride. If it's less than um, 15 milli, milli equivalents of, um, per liter, you're talking about volume de, de, um, dilution, which is, uh, sorry, depletion, which is associated with highly efficient reabsorption of sodium chloride and bicarb, right? That's what aldosterone is trying to do. It's trying to hold on as you have a metabolic, uh, metabolic alkalosis from contraction, right? What are these scenarios where you have such a chloride, um, uh, where you have a uh, chloride less than 15 milli equivalents? Gastric losses, volume depletion, like dehydration, diuretic therapy, all right? So both of, all of these scenarios are chloride responsive patients, but what we're talking about is really um, uh, the significance or how, how uh, if they're chloride responsive, um, what their urine chloride tells you um, gives you clues to what the diagnosis is, right? So let's say that the urine chloride is greater than 25 milliequivalents. Well, in those situations, what you're looking at is somebody who has increased activity of their aldosterone, right? Increased activity in their aldosterone, um, or they have severe hypokalemia, which is one of the reasons why you can't correct your metabolic alkalosis until you correct the severe hypokalemia. All right. So metabolic compensation um, for metabolic alkal respiratory compensation for metabolic alkalosis, um, it's um, it's uh, probably even harder to do than a respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis because now you're telling the patient to do what, hypoventilate, right? So we can't get our patients to hypoventilate very well, and certainly not for a long time. Okay, and there's the expected CO2 governed by that equation. All right. Again, metabolic alkalosis does what to the um, dissociation, oxygen dissociation curve? It holds on to the oxygen tighter, therefore it's a left shift, okay? It's a left shift, and that's not good. So I always say that metabolic, I prefer my patient to be a little bit acidemic. I don't want them to be uh, uh, having alkalemia because of this oxygen dissociation curve issue. And I think metabolic alkalosis is an under, um, underappreciated entity, particularly in the surgical intensive care unit. All right, let's move on to respiratory processes. So let's start with respiratory alkalosis. Question is a 65-year-old man who's post-up day four from a Hartman's procedure for obstructing colon cancer. His GI recovery has been going well. You are notified that the patient is complaining of shortness of breath uh, with pulse ox of 92% on a face mask. The ABG reveals 7.5, uh, CO2 of 23 and bicarb of 24. The most appropriate next step in management is loop diuretic, troponins, uh, spiral CT of the chest, remove staples from the midline incision, or albuterol treatment. Great. So the American Board of Surgery, for, um, for whatever reason, uh, uh, equates hypoxia and hyperventilation to PE, right? So the scenario will be hypoxia, hypoventilation in a post-op period equals PE, all right? And hypoventilation will show itself as a low CO2, right? Good. And I think doing, the, with the exception maybe the Lasix, I think everything else are very reasonable things. But um, the most important thing to get to the crux of the matter is that the patient has likely a pulmonary embolism. Okay. Respiratory alkalosis. So ventilation is driven by central and peripheral chemo pH receptors, right? So that um, lies in the brainstem and carotid um, body. And hyperventilation is defined by a decrease PaCO2. The com uh, compensation uh, is is renal now. So the metabolic processes are com compensated by respiratory. Respiratory processes are compensated metabolically by the kidney. And because of that, it takes a little bit of time. Right? We typically um, think of metabolic compensation, renal compensation, respiratory processes as an acute or chronic issue. Acute is defined uh, for anything that's greater, uh, less than 12 hours. So if your respiratory disturbance has been less than 12 hours, the compensation from your kidney clearly hasn't been uh, is not in full effect. All right? 
So if you have a respiratory alkalosis, um, for every 10 millimeters of CO2 change, you should see two milliequivalents of bicarb change. What does that mean? So if you have um, uh, a respiratory alkalosis and your CO2 is uh, 20, let's say, right? That's about 20 points below normal. So I would expect what kind of a compensation for the kidney? Well, the kidney would say, well, I'm respiratory alkalosis. I got to get rid of bicarb. So I'm going to get rid of bicarb to the tune of two milliequivalents per liter for every 10 change in CO2. So I'm going to drop my bicarb from 24 to about 20, right? And that will bring me close back to normal pH. Well, if you've had more than 12 hours, the kidney should be in full effect if it's not in renal, if your patient's not in renal failure and they have proper kidney function, right? So in a chronic process, you're expecting compensation or compensatory mechanism to be a little bit more effective to the tune of about three to five milliequivalents per liter. Okay? So for that same patient who's had respiratory alkalosis, had 20, um, 20 points of drop in their CO2, now I'm, I'm expecting the kidney to kick out at least 6 to 10 milliequivalents of bicarb. So now we're down to 18 to, um, can't do that math in my head real quick, 16 you said? No. But bottom line is you're going you're gonna to get rid of bicarb to the tune of um, 6 to 10 milliequivalents. All right. Respiratory acidosis, so it's going to be the opposite pretty much, right? Okay, so respiratory acidosis is bad because that suggests that the patient um, has likely at the root of it all alveolar hypoventilation. Uh, it also, by the way, tells you that if your patient is retaining CO2, that might be one of the first signs that have gone into respiratory failure and impending, uh, impending respiratory failure. They've quote-unquote tired out, and that patient either needs positive pressure ventilation if a, a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation if they can protect their airway uh, and B, if they don't have uh, like uh, active vomiting or GI bleeding going on, okay? Just something to remember. Um, so with respiratory acidosis, your CO2 comes up, right? But again, like I said, it can be a very late sign. Our classic, uh, our classic um, COPD, the, the patient that, that is not a COP. So you, when you have a patient that has a COPD and you wonder whether or not the patient is a chronic retainer, uh, you just have to, on your, on, uh, shortly after admission, you just got to look at their ABG and see whether or not they're, they're compensated for high CO2s, right? If their pH is near normal and their CO2 is 65, yeah, that patient's a chronic CO2 retainer because our body is going to desperately try to get back to normal pH. All right. But if your COPD, or, or, uh, COPD patient that's on home six liters of oxygen that comes in, has a CO2 of 60, and has a pH of 7.2, that patient, despite you looking at how bad their COPD is, was not a chronic retainer. All right. Okay, so compensation for respiratory acidosis is renal, right? So it's just the opposite of respiratory alkalosis. Now what do we have to do? Instead of getting rid of bicarb, we've got to hold on to bicarb, right? Well, luckily our kidneys are better at holding on to bicarb than trying to get rid of it, frankly, all right? So same, same thing, but just in the opposite direction, so I won't belabor that point. Okay, COPD patients, I already talked about this. This, this concept of hypoxic drive is a myth. All right. So you know how we don't want their we don't want to give them luxury oxygenation because well they're dependent on their um, their oxygen for breathing. That's not the case, right? They are actually still dependent on their CO2 by the brainstem and the carotid sinus pH um, uh, uh, receptors. All right. So and and the theory behind is the CO2 COPD patients vasoconstrict due to hypoxic portions of the poor alveolar function. All right. And with the oxygen therapy, the vasoconstriction actually decreases. So the end result is perfusion of a poorly ventilated alveoli with less CO2. So what you're doing by giving a patient, so it's not that they won't breathe anymore, but you get worsening oxygenation in COP, um, a COPD or by giving them more oxygen because you are increasing the VQ mismatch. All right. Base excesses and deficits, all right? So, you know, the point is this. It's a calculated value with, with major assumptions, but it's potentially another indicator of hypoperfusion. When you guys get an ABG from your labs, um, it will tell you what the base excess is, or if it's a minus number, it's called a base deficit, right? And so we've been taught that base deficit is a potential indicator that you're not perfusing well. But so just, and that's generally true, and we've studied in multiple patient populations, including the trauma patient population. But just re recognize that it is a calculated value. It's not magic. All it is saying is we know what we expect the compensatory mechanisms to be. And if this patient were fully comp uh, compensated, this is what their bicarb should be. 
right? It's just a computer calculating it, so you can literally calculate it yourself. And then it says, if this is the expected value and this is the actual value, I'm just going to subtract the difference and, and spit it out to the clinician as a base deficit or excess, all right? It's an, it's an indication to how well compensated the patient is, all right? I'll skip this ABG analysis, okay? So the ABG, the pH, the PaO2, and the PaCO2 are uh, measured, okay? Everything else are calculated, specifically the base excess or deficit, okay? Let's do some case scenarios and then uh, give you an opportunity to ask some questions, okay? So this is a 34-year-old man presents to the ED after three days of profound diarrhea. He's intolerant of PO except minimal amounts of water. The expected acid-base findings in this patient include uh, metabolic alkalos alkalosis, increased anion gap, increased bicarb, uh, pH less than 7.4, or a CO2 greater than 45. Great, so this is going to be a contraction. Um, this patient's going to have a contraction alkalosis, isn't he, right, from, from diarrhea. And specifically, so the answer is what 75% of you picked, which is the metabolic alkalosis. And, um, and so there's no really, um, uh, uh, if you thought that the patient could have a metabolic acidosis, this would be a non-anion gap acidosis, right? If you had a, uh, if you had a complete uh, metabolic acidosis from anion gap. So um, this patient, what would most significantly have a metabolic um, contraction alkalosis? Now, um, if if you uh, the the pH of less than 7.4 would be for that um, specific scenario where the patient has a non-anion gap um, uh, metabolic acidosis due to diarrhea. Um, so let's see. The same patient has this ABG. Uh, what is the next step of management? So you have the same. You have an ABG of 7.33 and a uh, uh, CO2 of 33, bicarb of 16. The potassium is 2.9. Uh, creatinine is 1.5. The bicarb is 16. What would be the next man step in management? Sure, fluid bolus, right? So fluid bolus. So I guess the the, uh, the 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 main point of this is to point out the volume contraction and um, and the non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And how about the same patient? What is the expected CO2 if uh, he was appropriately compensated? Okay, a little bit of a split here. So we have a metabolic acidosis here, right? Let's go through that ABG real quick. You have a 733, which is an acidemia. Uh, bicarb, uh, sorry, CO2 is 33, so that's not the primary process. The bicarb is 16, so that's low from the perfect 24. So this is a metabolic acidosis, and the compensation for metabolic acidosis is Winter's formula, right? 1.5 times the bicarb, so that's 8 plus 16 is 24 plus 8, so that's 32, plus or minus 2, okay? So we're in the range of 33 is the correct answer when you, do the win when you apply the Winters formula to this. Okay, next question. 67-year-old man with COPD presents with glucose of 760 uh, and an apparent infected ulcer of the lower extremity. The ABG shows 7.25, 65, and 13. So the CO2 is 60, 65, and the bicarb is 13. There are the electrolytes. What is the diagnosis? All right. Um, okay, let's let's work through this ABG. All right. So um, this patient most likely has what? A, probably a DKA, right? So if you have a sugar of, I mean, you don't want to never assume, but the glucose is 760. Let's just do something real quick. Let's just calculate the anion gap. 
right? Anion gap is the cat major cation of sodium, so that's 132, minus the sum of your two major anions, right? So your bicarb and your chloride. Bicarb is 13, and your chloride is 95. When you add those two numbers together, that's 108. So 132 minus 108 is 24. So your anion gap is 24 there. So this patient must very much likely has a metabolic acidosis. The ABG, let's take a look at that. The pH of 7.25 is an acidemia. You've got the CO2 is 65, right? So you can stop right there and you already know that this patient has a respiratory acidosis, okay? So you go, all right. That's not, so your eye is drawing you to the bicarb, right, with a DKA, but you want to go systematically. So you have 7.25 and a CO2 of 65, which means that the patient has a respiratory acidosis. Um, and then you say to yourself, well, is the patient compensated? Okay, I, we don't even need to go through the exercise, and we know the patient's not compensated because the patient has a pH of 7.25, right? But let's just go through the exercise. So let's assume that this patient has a chronic metabolic acidosis as defined by greater than, 24, uh, greater than 12 hours, right? So if your CO2 is 65, it's about 25 points above normal, right? You would expect your bicarb to go up, right, to try to compensate for this. And you want the bicarb to go up to at least about eight points or so, just to compensate for that 25 increase. So the bicarb should be 24 plus eight, which is 32, but instead the bicarb is 13. So not only is it not compensated, it also has a primary metabolic acidosis. This patient has then a combined respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Why is this happening? This patient is on the verge, this DKA patient from an infected um, ulcer is on the, on the verge of respiratory failure. They're also hypoventilating, right? What's that? Why not? Yeah, you're right. Um, so the comment is that can't be a real um, bl blood gas, and I said yes, you're right. Okay, um, so what is the appropriate next step? Same clinical scenario. Should we give calcium? Should we give bicarb? Lots of fluid, insulin drip, intubate the patient, and help with ventilation. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, so, so when 87% of you disagree with me, I, I have to at least consider that as the correct answer. So yes, you're right. Airway is always number one, all right, um, because the patient's hypoventilating to a point where they're respiratory acidosis. But the situation here is very dire for the patient because they have a severe metabolic acidosis and also a potassium of six. So I guess it's a matter of, I suppose, if you are... If you want to go with trauma and say ABCs, then yes, intubation is probably number one because the patient's hypoventilating. Um, but one could make the argument that we want to stabilize the patient's uh, myocardium because of the hyperkalemia. Okay, what is the expected CO2? We sort of already we did that already through the ABG analysis. Okay, so this, um, this illustrates one of those things about uh, not chicken and the egg, but what, what should we jump to first? Because you have a patient who you clini clinically seriously think that has a metabolic acidosis, right? Nobody would doubt a 760 and an anion gap with a pH of 725 has a metabolic acidosis. But then you get this pH and you say to yourself, well, if I was supposed to do it, if I were supposed to do it um, uh, systematically, I, I stop at the CO2 and I assign this patient a primary respiratory acidosis, right? But I'm just telling you that it doesn't really matter. Let's just assume this patient has a primary metabolic acidosis. What should the CO2 be, right? So if you have a primary metabolic acidosis, then it's governed by the Winters formula once again, right? So it's 1.5 times bicarb of 13. So what's that? Six and a half, right? So that should be 19 plus eight, which is 27, okay? So this patient, either way you look at it, whether you jump to metabolic acidosis first or you go to respiratory acidosis first, the compensatory mechanism is calculated the same way and you will recognize both ways by analyzing it both ways that the patient uh, 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 has a combined process and are, are neither respiratorily or um, uh, uh, metabolically compensated.
Okay, so if your expected CO2 should be 27 and now your CO2 is 65, clearly the patient also has a uh, combined respiratory acidosis. All right, a couple more, I think. A 70 year old man status post a low anterior resection is becoming tachypnic, hypoxic, and diaphoretic. Here's the ABG. What is the primary process? Should be an easier question. Just literally identify the primary process. Great. Respiratory alkalosis, and I said earlier that if the patient is hyperventilating and hypoxic, they have a pulmonary embolism. Okay? Clearly in clinical in real life they have other things going on probably, but all right. Which statement is true about the same patient, same ABG? And this is specifically asking you about uh, uh, compensation here. <coughs> wow, great. Okay. <laughs> so uh, pulmonary embolism, all right? Um, but let's look at A real quick. The patient is fully compensated by renal mechanisms. Well, clearly not because the seven pH of 7.5 is telling you that the patient, whether this is realistically a real ABG or not, uh, in this made-up scenario, the patient is not compensated, right? Because what would you expect the compensation to be in a respiratory alkalosis? What should the bicarb be? Let's just all mentally do that in our own head so we get, we get this concept down, okay? So respiratory alkalosis, renal compensation. Let's say this is a, a chronic scenario already, more than 12 hours. So your CO2 has dropped 10. So your bicarb should decrease by six, or uh, sorry, about three to five milliequivalents, right? Because now it's chronic compensation. Okay. So your bicarb should be thirty-seven or thirty-five-ish. Okay. So this patient also probably has a combined metabolic al alkalosis as well. All right, that's the end of acid base. Any questions for me? Um, I think the most important thing is to remember the pulmonary embolism scenario where you have the respiratory alkalosis. So definitely remember that um, scenario. All right, I want to wish everybody um, all the best for your exams. All right, so thank you very much.